Well, let's let's talk about Samo for. That was the work with me and Al Diaz. You know, I'm a kid named Al Diaz. Mm-hmm. That I went to school with. Uh, okay, this is it. This is the Holy Grail right here. Or no, the more like the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> Samo by Jean. Jean Basquiat, it wasn't Jean Michel, it was Jean Basquiat. How about that? That's interesting. Um, this was, me and Jean were actually instrumental in putting together a school newspaper. We went, we went, we both were transfers from other schools. Uh, we, went, we, went, we met at City as a School, which was an alternative high school for. I guess uh, fairly good students that had uh, that were misfits and they couldn't uh, get it together in high school, but you had to have a certain average to get in. So it was, it, you know, it wasn't just like a place where you, you had to actually be admitted to the school, and there was a test or whatever. It, you had to have a certain, uh, certain percentage of credit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, so we met there. And into the first year, I think it was the first year that we, we started a school newspaper because we were both interested in writing and just being creative and it was it seemed like a good idea. Anyway, so this is one of the one and this is in really good condition. I'm I'm really quite impressed. Uh so th this yeah, this is an art this is an uh, a short of uh, a fictional satirical short story written by Jean, by Jean Basquiat. There's no Michel. I, I love that. And it was about this this religion. Anyway, I'll read it for you. I was I was uh, uh, looking for a practical re religion. Went for the whole family, and I noticed your ad in the Voice. I I said to the man in the lime green suit across the desk. He lay, he laid a pearly white on me and put down the pipe he was smoking. Name's Jones, son. Quasimodo Jones. He stuck his hand out. Something, uh, something about the man reminded me of Fred McMurray. <laughs> I'm Harry Sneed, I said, grasping his, his sweaty palm. He started off his shtick with the smallest of small talk. So what do you hear about... So, so, <laughs> so what do you hear about xylitol? <laughs> I've seen the ads, I said, faking a smile. So what kind of religion were you interested in? Something Eastern, Western? We're running a Zen Buddhist two-for-one sale this month. I sort of wanted something provocative yet normal. Hmm, said Jones, thumbing through a catalog. What about Judaism? I came, I came from a long, distinguished line of anti-Semites. I think they'd object. Besides, I never really believed that Red Sea stuff. Catholicism is quite popular during the summer months, Mr. Sneed. No, Mr. Jones, I wanted something modern and stylish. Have you considered L Lennyism based on the teachings of Lenny Bruce, the beatnik messiah? Very fashionable among the bohemian sect, said Jones. No, I said, I don't think so. He leaned over the desk and whispered, What about Samo? Samo, I asked? Why, yes, I'm a Samoid myself. Tell me more about this, this Samo, I asked curiously. Samo, began Jones, is, is the belief of mercy in which we all do what we want here on earth and then rely totally on the mercy of God on the pretense that we didn't know. That's the basis of it all. We didn't know. Once a week we attend services where the Samo priest places a piece of yarn on our eyebrows, symbolic of the, of the wool over our... <laughs> I fumbled from my checkbook. Make that payable to religion, Matt. The religion supermarket, son, said Jones. Beaming, uh, okay, then beaming music swells, titles rise, the end, life goes on. So that was, Jean was actually a pretty good writer. I mean, I mean this is what, seven, 16, 17 years old? Yeah. So, so that was, okay, we had been, tossing this word around. It was kind of part of our lexicon, this same old thing. It was it didn't just like appear from nowhere. This is we Samo was originally like from from the old like okay, I guess we could call it an African um, African American expression of same old same old. Like when a, a guy says, "Hey, what's up, babe?" Oh, same old same old this kind of thing. And we loved that cuz we we were really into slang and we you know, we like we we just co-opted all this stuff and we, and it became part of our lexicon. 
and uh, and it it kind of morphed meaning. It didn't mean so much same old like same old same old anymore. So by this time, it, it this completely gave it a whole a whole another edge. Now it was this fictional religion, and we played with that, and that's and like within a week. We made uh, these fake testimonial drawings of people that had, you know, experienced SAMO and they were completely, you know, they embraced SAMO and they were loving it. So, and we handed them out on the street. You know, it was, it was just a bunch of stone kids, right? Me, but mom, I mean, this was, it, it was, me and, and Jean were at the helm, but we had our, like, you know, our Did associates. Did you guys know anything about school. Church of the Sub Genius or any of the spoof religions that had right, come right, up? Right. Did you guys know about that stuff? No, or? I don't think we we were like totally. Uh, I mean, we may have heard, uh, you know, a thing or two here, but we weren't that well versed in in this kind of thing. You know, we were just kind of just making it up and having fun with it, and um, so. After after we did this thing with the handing out the leaflets with the testimonials, like within another week, I I being a graffiti artist from like seventy one, you know, I you know I started writing graffiti when I was twelve. I I mean it naturally was like let's you know let's make turn this into a graffiti campaign and we're gonna like start spreading like same was coming, so almost like pray or or Jesus saves or one of those, but with a you know with a a, a satirical edge to it. And like within, I mean, it just from there, it's you know we started spreading that like this kind of ominous thing, like Samo is coming, Samo dot dot dot, you know, with a uh, ellipsis, which I actually bought up from Flint, the uh, the graffiti artist who, who was one of the first guys to do messages, you know, like Flint for those who dare, Flint for ladies. He would mostly. He mostly did like movie quotes and stuff from like James Bond, like, but it was, it, it had, and it, it was all also done in, in very block print. So I kind of used that as, as a, as a boilerplate for, for what we were doing. Cause I was aware of this stuff. I, I, I had gone to high school with Flint and, but we took it in, we, we were, you know, being a little more literate and a little more, um, talking about stuff. So the next phase was we started doing, um, you know, like social, I mean, uh, commentary, uh, observations that we were making. And remi remember, this is from the minds of a 17 and an uh, 18 year old kid. So, you know, and we, it was fairly cynical and, and some of it was very funny. I mean, even, and, and, and absolutely relevant. You know, when I, I, I see some of the things, I still, to this day, you know, like I, I mean, the, the, the one of my favorite ones is same old as an all as an end to mass produced individuality, which was, you know, that's always going to be relevant. <laughs> and it was, I mean, so you know, that was that was, but, but this it was this article that really took that word that we had been throwing around and turned it into something that would really, be, you know, that we. That we're, a we're able to, to start a graffiti campaign with. You know? The Soho Weekly News gave Jean his first commercial illustration. Right. And that is right here. Can right. we let's okay. take a look at that? Now this says to Cynic from Samo. He was a he was a, a a very important person in our life, especially our young life. Um, I had a girlfriend in in seventy seven. I I, I uh, my my girlfriend was Kate McCamey, who was a I guess. You could refer to her as an art art brat. She grew up in Tribeca during the seventies when there was uh, hardly anybody living down there, and and they grew up in an AIR lo loft, you know, up in in a t I mean, way before Soho re was renovated and all all that. It was very funky, very you know, um, unusual, unusual for the time, and and. Uh, and she was my girlfriend, and because of her, we became exposed to the downtown art scene. And as a result, uh, I, well, I, I was working. I, I was. A, it's a very convoluted story. I'll, uh, I'll get to the to, to the cynic part. I ended up working for this guy Richard Cynic, who had been a who had gone to SVA, had moved, had a, a, a family. You know, he, he got married, had a daughter had a loft on West Broadway early on, once again, you know, during the, the ARA days. Um, 
didn't really make it as a, a he did these these canvas type sculptures like kind of a Christo-esque sort of a thing mm -hmm. and he and then he 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 got into he was he was he, first of all he was a um a Czech American who grew up in Queens very blue collar very working class um he, his father was a butcher he worked in the butcher shop but he had aspirations of being an artist which was probably you know like coming from that stock and that background was probably like some weird shit back then you know like what, what do you mean you want to be an artist anyway but he he moved to to, to soho had this had uh he was making chess pieces that was his thing he was a, a, a he was a metalsmith and then he got it somehow he gradually became became involved in casting white metal and I guess he put his art career to the side and had a casting shop in, in when Soho was still light industry. There was like, you know, metal, uh, like electroplating and, and white metal casting, this kind of stuff was going on. And he got went full force into just becoming a, a you know, once again, into his working class thing. And I guess he, 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 he uh, lost that dream of becoming an artist, but still was it, it, it based in Soho and that whole world was going on around him and he was a, a bitter sort of guy because of it. Mm -hmm. He was probably, uh, he was, I mean, he went to SVA, so he was probably there during a period where, where you know, some, some of those people probably succeeded and, you know, his classmates, if you will. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so okay, me and Jean worked at, at, as as uh, casters. You know, it was like, and it was like a part time. You know, at this point, his his business, he had, his heyday was over. He was you know just barely surviving with the business. And we were because of a girlfriend, this that the other thing. I ended up working for this guy, and then I brought Jean in because it was just, it was basically beer and weed money that we were making, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 Richard Sinek was going through a full blown midlife crisis. And uh, and and he'd come out with us to the mud club at, at at night. You know, he was like a forty year old guy, and we're like teen, and we're all it was totally like dysfunctional, crazy, weird, but it was fun. But uh, his bitterness started to come through, and, and Jean's aspirations to to, to become an artist, uh, cynic, with his history, you know. He expressed some kind of like racism, racist kind of, of sentiments and some, um, n not very, he was not very nurturing towards Jean's ambitions. And that may have served as a, okay, I'll show you, you know, because Jean was just like that. He was like, oh, you think I'll, I'll never make, you know, he was like telling him, oh, but the art world is very white, which was all true and everything. But it was almost in this kind of like, you know, like trying to hold him back kind of way. And you know, and he was he was a bitter guy. He, I mean, he meant really well. He he had a good heart, but you could see that he he was a damaged soul, right? And he he was not very nurturing to, to Jean, but I think it actually had a reverse effect. So I think, and no one ever, no nobody. I'm I mean, I'm one of the. So was this given to Cynic to kind of show him, hey, I am an artist. Here, look, you know, um, these these two pieces are going to go into Boom Basquiat. They're going to travel around. They're going to be exhibited in Europe and a few other places. They probably won't come back for a, for a while. In a year or two, when the time is right, to organize a Samo show. Absolutely. To combine photographs, ephemera, and new work that you want to do on canvas that can be sold. Have it exhibited. Have it come out with the book, with the documentary, and sell the feature film absolutely absolutely i'm all about this at this point i i mean you know there's a, a lot going on with this same old stuff okay so so it's you know, it's not it's not like laying there you know all right so this this is just one little piece of that this puzzle that of, one, can help one, you build your empire absolutely so, absolutely uh, and yeah. i and i totally appreciate your involvement and this whole thing is very exciting yeah and i think marvin is a key guy for me to meet because Absolutely. he buys the collection. Who knows? And this might end up at NYU someday. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? It's quite entirely possible. It's really great stuff. The stories I didn't know any of that about the same. Well, that's no, really I, very amazing. Very few people know about this yeah. whole thing, because, uh, it, and it's really important. I, mm -hmm. I think because knowing Basquiat, having that 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 connection, I saw this develop, and I saw that as part of probably the the the, the, the fuel that fired. Stop it.